You see the paintings before you? Yeah. Oh, many men outside the appraiser stores of the customs service where I was working then. He was with his wife to be, Lee Krasner, me and Nor Krasner, I insist on going. And he was this kind of, the only time I ever saw Jackson wear a hat. And he looked like a businessman from Kansas City. <laughs> yes. And a over, overcoat, it was wintertime. And Lee said to me, this guy's a great painter. He will be, so forth. And I said, all right, okay. I liked what he did in 44. He ran into some kind of trouble in 45, 46. After uh, the mural, after the... Yeah, well, a year or so. There was some he was struggling, I was reaching for Picasso. And, uh, and I wasn't the only one to notice that, though. It wasn't said until later. And then he did um, a couple of small pictures called Eyes in the Heat. They're like finger painting. Well, they actually painted straight out of the tube. He put the nozzle of the tube right to the canvas. And I said, that, that's it, that's it, that's it. Did you tell him that? Yeah, oh yeah, I always said, uh, yeah. said, you know, visit him, I like this, I don't like that, and so forth. And then, in the summer of 47, it was, then the first uh, spatter, drip, poured paintings came. And, uh, but I thought he was a great painter before that. And the one thing I wanted to quote to you and ask you about because it seems close in language to s things you said about him at the time was the uh, the statement of purpose he did for the Guggenheim Award in 47 I intend to paint large movable pictures which will function between the easel and the mural I believe the easel picture to be a dying form and the tendency of modern feeling is towards the wall picture or mural I believe the time is not yet ripe for a full transition from easel to mural. The pictures I contemplate painting would constitute a halfway state and an attempt to point out the direction of the future without arriving there completely. Now, he expressed himself damn well, you yeah. know? What was it? Yeah, it's lovely. Hard-headed. What do you think he means by the time being not yet ripe? God, I have to talk about myself here. Damn it. I had been carrying on about the demise of the easel painting quite wrongly. So, oh, someone said, I got the idea for him. No, it was yeah. And uh, after Pollock gave some interview about not wanting to do easel paintings, not the Guggenheim uh, statement wasn't quoted. I had to say to him, Pollock, never listen to what's written about you. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, uh, I'd written this piece in Partisan Review about the easel painting, you know, and uh, no beginning, middle, and ending. When he said to an interviewer that uh, these pictures had no beginning, middle, and I said, oh, Jackson, can't do that. You're repeating what I said in Partisan Review, and don't you know better? I was wrong. Damn it. I was wrong. Oh, he got sheepish about it, that's all. And uh, 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 I said, Don't, uh, that, uh, I thought this was highfalutin intellectual journalism on my part. He objected to the pictures of a friend of his. I won't mention his name. He said they were just easel paintings. And I knew what he meant. They were still easel paintings, but just easel paintings. Well, Pollock's own pictures remained easel paintings to the end. Even the so-called, the long ones of friezes, which were very startling at the time. Uh, now that other painters have done these long, long, narrow paintings. But at the time, and I remember calling them friezes, they were still easel paintings. And uh, I was being uh, uh, one of those premature uh, f futurists, you know, Know, seeing uh, 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 crucial change or epochal change before it happened, you know, the, the uh, 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 over-anticipation of the future. Yes. But don't but you think knew? he saw that too? Or don't you think he had a very strong sense of his pictures as being, he, he calls them a, a halfway state yeah, and an right, attempt right. to point out the direction of the future? Well, he knew better than I when he said that. And it is a fact that he wasn't 
painting murals, he knew that. And it is a fact that, on the other hand, we were objecting to cabinet pictures, as Herbert Reed uh, would, he called them. And that's mm -hmm. the one uh, uh, felicitous thing that late Sir Herbert uh, uh, episode. Uh, uh, and there was a kind of uh, a discontent with uh, the cabinet picture, the, the, the tidy picture on an easel. And then in the next generation, that question seemed to uh, get uh, blown away. Yes. When you saw someone like Morris Lewis, maybe, you know, uh, Olitsky or no one. The question of the easel picture, the tidy picture on mm -hmm. an easel that was all in control, uh, uh, disappeared. Now, in the 19th century, the French had painted way better pictures than the, uh, bigger pictures than the Americans did. Mm -hmm. Better is a nice slip. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it wasn't a question of size, because uh, uh, Courbet's studio, which is a great, great picture, is a contained picture. Yeah. Now, something yeah. about getting away from that contained, right. boxed thing, which well, is one reason Pollock painted an unstretched canvas and why he painted so big uh, from time to time. He wanted to find his way to the edges of the picture mm -hmm. rather than start out with them those edges being given yeah. as they would have been on a stretch canvas. Bonnard had anticipated that. Bonnard painted on on stretch canvas. Right. And then would cut out. The yes, I mean, it seems as though there's two strands in that mm -hmm. statement. I mean, the, the, the one that strand that away from the containment and orderliness of the Not order, no. no? Uh, a, a good art is always orderly. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. You well, find a new kind of order, that's all. Yes. Neatness, perhaps. It was uh, the, what by then had become, especially since Cezanne. Uh, Cezanne had been more conscious of the shape of the format than anyone before. You know, repeating the uh, uh, shape of the picture, the shape of the canvas inside. And uh, that had become, I mean, cubism had driven that home. Yeah. And it was a breakout from synthetic cubism. The contained picture, and which until then had been there was nothing wrong as such. Yes. But for Pollock and uh, others, it became a confining notion. They, that kind of well-made picture, yes. you know, had the well-madeness had to come uh, from somewhere else. You time and again say in the forties, right, mm -hmm. that that it seems as though I mean the ma that the main course of modern art is not is not a course which is all about the kind of desperation and violence and uh, you know intense morbid mm. alienation right of modern experience but uh, yeah. these guys put art together in a kind of cooler in some ways more ruthless right hedonistic way apollinian yes apollinian yeah now Pollock isn't Apollonian. No, is he's not. He's Dionysian. Yes. Mm -hmm. And don't you think that's that's a sort of serious tension between you and his art? It's not just you standing above his art and trying to take your distance. It's mm -hmm. it's you confronting an art that you think you, you know is great. It's you know uh, you're trusting to mm -hmm. your experience of it, and yet it's a problem for you that it's the characterization of. Oh of the art was the problem. Actually, uh, time went by, I saw Pollock as being not so Dionysian or Dionysian, mm, mm. more Apollonian, and uh, all, I think all great painting gets quiet in the end. Yes. Uh, whether it's Rubens' oil sketch or, uh, yes. or Pollock's uh, all over. Uh, uh, it was a, the trouble was a damn uh, uh, characterization, and I went into kind of cultural journalism, and, and I had to live and learn. And then I had to learn, and I had to say it again. You don't ask anything of art except that it be good. 
you don't prescribe, you don't uh, mm. make specific demands that art do this, art do that. When it's good, it does everything. What's looked through is the discipline. And the discipline that <coughs> has something to do with the difference between the good ones, the good paintings, and the bad ones. Yes. They chiseled off pictures of failure. On the other hand, one and lavender mist mm. are great successes. Blue Poles is a failure, as Jackson himself recognized. Didn't the technique often produce canvases that were rejected by Pollock himself as incoherence? I mean, did uh, it not because they were incoherent, because they failed. Mm -hmm. Incoherent isn't the word. All right. They failed, and uh, well, again, I have to pat myself. We'd uh, look at them together and agree. Yes. And it was so pragmatic. Oh, it's so practical. It was so down to earth. A, a picture would come off, and it wouldn't come off. Yes. Or another one wouldn't come off, and yes. it was whether it came off or not, and nothing else. Right. And uh, only your eye could tell you whether it came off. Nothing else could. Yes. As, as the same is true with Goya or uh, Pierre. Uh, only your eye could tell you. Of course, but I mean. You, this is leaving aside the fact that uh, Pollock has, has pushed himself or been led right into an arena where the picture coming off or not right is dependent on a very strange, exacerbated, risky set of proceedings. No, that's melodrama. Is it? No, it was day in, day out, just like uh, it, it had was for an impressionist. Some days you were hot, some days you weren't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was no screwing yourself up or getting yourself into a What's state. What's the procedure for, then, do you think, looking what back? What procedure? Yeah, the, the procedure was a way of putting paint on. Yes, but what, what do you think were its, its advantages for him? Why did he, what, why did he oh. think that that was the way to do it? That, because, like Hoffman, he had noticed that when you use your elbow, wrist, and shoulder, somehow your, your, t your uh, education as an artist t tends to cut. Mm. And he found that when you drop paint on the surface, it would you know, somehow not cut. That right. wouldn't what solve was, the whole question. What does cut mean here? Break the plane. Break the plane. That's right. And, uh, uh, mm. And uh, th that's why he, uh, look, oh, Hoffman had done it first, didn't follow up. Jackson found that this was the way he didn't have to worry about his wrist or his elbow or shoulder, mm -hmm. the little thing that gets you when you try to draw in abstract, you know, in, a sh in shallow depth. Yes. And uh, it's as technical as that, and he was, it was just down there. and. So you didn't cut. And sometimes when he stopped uh, uh, using his spatter and poured into it, he, and he'd become so accomplished in the meantime, God, he could draw better from life after 10 years of abstract painting than he could before. Yes. So, well, so the uh, black and white, okay, the black and white show was good. And, but he knew he couldn't take his brush you know, do this. Mm. Yet, uh, uh, use something else. On the one hand, you know, looking back at it, there are many of those, particularly of the drip paintings, right, which look marvelously open, lyrical, you know, mm. achieved. Uh, Apollonian, I suppose, in your sense. Yeah. Now, some others of the drip paintings don't look like that yeah. still, right? They look like an effort, they look like, you know... Uh, when they fail. Do you think the one in Dusseldorf, for instance, the black and white one, fails? Yeah, fails. Mm -hmm. but you, so, it, you think that failure has to do, right, with the mark of effort and... Uh, no, no. Uh, nobody, no one. No, no, not Kant, not Schopenhauer, not Trotsky has been able to say what makes a work of art succeed, what makes it fail. You stab, you grope, yeah. you grope, 
And, well, uh, stab and growth in this case. I mean, well, what, what, what makes for failure, in your view, in those drip paintings? The, uh, when the things don't sit. And look, Pollock himself knew would worry about the things that didn't sit. And he'd go back into them. And, uh, and sometimes he'd rescue the painting, sometimes he wouldn't. Yeah. And uh, Pollock was extraordinary in, uh, as a human being. He lost his stuff in 52. And I remember going to the uh, Carnegie National in uh, Pittsburgh in 52. I think it was, and he had, there was a 53 pictures of, picture of his hanging next to Carl Henning Peterson, the Danish painter, and the Peterson was showing his picture up, and I saw Jackson, said, how did it look? And I said, no, nope, it wasn't there, and he nodded, and the picture the Guggenheim has out of the deep, I think, the deep, no, it was on or something, and he just missed. And he didn't resent my saying that uh, his pictures hadn't been so hot since yeah. 52. They felt so isolated. Mm -hmm. Unless you lived through those days, you can't imagine how alone these people felt. Yes. The fact that the Museum of Modern Art had bought a Pollock didn't affect that one bit. The fact that he was taken up by Peggy Guggenheim, more credit to her, yeah. didn't seem to affect you. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, until until the mid fifties, a little later, the isolation felt by those whom I consider the best artists of the time yeah. was. Uh, can you mitigate isolation? All right, it was unmitigated. Yes. And, uh, no, that's changed. That's changed. The art boom took care of that. Yes. Now, uh, but what, famous look, artists are celebrities. Right. They wanted what we all want. Fame and money. Yes. And girls, too, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, according to Freud. <laughs> really? Of they course, well, down to that. There's nothing wrong with wanting yeah. fame, girls, and money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what kind of fame, right? Fame with whom? Fame based on what where kind fame. of achievement? One knew where fame was. Fame was in the magazines, the papers, the... Uh, so you uh, think they had straightforward art market ambitions, right? Uh, to finish? Art market ambitions, that's a bad way of putting it. They wanted to live better. Yes. As any normal human being does. Of course. They weren't mercenary. They wouldn't do a thing just in order to sell. Mm. Good God, no. That was unthinkable. And, uh, but it became a question of, you couldn't dissolve your own anxieties, your own aspirations, and so forth, in larger ones. Yes. It was your own art. Yeah. It was your own writing. And you wanted to score, and you hoped to make a better living. And by God, uh, watching people like uh, Pollock and Smith and others live in those days, uh, uh, I had a job. You know, I'd see. It was, it was, uh, uh, it was tough. Yes, it was damn tough. He got notorious without being famous, mm. and he thought would sell one picture a year for a while. Yeah. and living on Osorio's advances. Thank goodness for Alfonso. Mm. The kind of machinery of publicity, right, which mm. already surrounded him to some extent at certain moments in his career, right? The name of the photographs, the double-page spread mm. with, you know, Jack in the Dripper life, in, life, in yeah. life magazine. What's all that about? Is that a play for a place in, in the market? Or, or, or it wasn't it? Jackson's doing. It wasn't. It wasn't his doing. He didn't seek it. Good God, he was the last man on earth to push. Well, he 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 sat he for the himself photographs. To he it. sat for the. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, you were supposed to. What you were supposed, supposed to. to. Well, this is the normal uh, uh, way of things. That if a magazine wanted to come around and make a fuss about you, you submitted. 
The name I of think... things are rather more elaborate than that, aren't they? I mean, that's lending Above. itself to a very well, highly Hans contrived name of, Oh, Hans name of, uh, was very much impressed by Pollock's art and by Pollock's personality. Yeah. And it wasn't... It was a more modest thing than you might imagine now. It wasn't uh, mm. with a big apparatus or anything. It was, yeah. They were making a, an avant-garde movie, as it were. Yeah. What got in the way was the fact that his fellow artists all through the 50s felt that he was a freak painter, that it wasn't properly speaking art, that the real painters were de Kooning and Klein, that what Pollock did was not real painting. It was some freakish thing. Yeah. Now, in the last year of his life, and it was only in the last year of his life when he came in to see his analyst, uh, Pollock uh, frequented uh, Cedar Street Tavern. He was aware of this, that he wasn't thought to be a painter, properly speaking. But he was all over, poor, drip, mm. spattered man. It was not real painting. It wasn't. I'd say art school painting. And, uh, and he was aware of that. Yes. He was aware of this feeling. And uh, so he was always drunk at the Street Tavern. And he'd, uh, he'd carry on. And that was part of the reason he carried on. So you now, think he was more of an outsider in the New York City yeah, than, than realizing yeah, the Yeah, that's right. It's only in retrospect that they put him in the Sea Street Tavern which he only visited in the last year of his life. He was never in the Cedar Street Tavern, though. Then Pollock, at the very end of his life, said, I didn't take enough look at the Impressionists. The Impressionists were, had been out for 40 years. He said, I didn't take, I've got to go back and look at the Impressionists. That's what he said at the end of his life. Had he lived longer and stopped drinking, he would have recovered. No, because he wouldn't have lived without recovering but damn he he had this romantic notion of an early death you know but people have that and I I, I I know that sort of stuff but he had that and he was telling Lee where he wanted to be buried and mm -hmm. so forth yeah. and, uh, and uh, all that and he had a constitution that is like a horse there was nothing wrong with him uh, uh, there was nothing wrong with Pollock, with all his drinking. His liver was still there and everything was still there. Mm. And uh, this shit about where he wanted to be buried out here, man, uh, like that, that romantic crap. Yeah, the, uh, you know, death is an overrated literary idea. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's nice to think of yourself dying early. It sounds good, anyhow, but... Tell he was full of shit, like everybody else. 